So, hey, this is John Reed. I'm joined by Brian Dennett, and I'm doing what I never have done in the past, which has actually commandeered my own hotel room because I could not find a quieter space. Brian, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I know it's the Sapphire Madness. I'm, I'm glad you found yeah. something for us to use. Yeah, you and I you and I go way back. Dialogues, I've done a podcast with you before. You were early into the potential of AI and the enterprise, so we had some talks about that as well. Yeah. Now you're SAP mentor, so there's some interesting history there. Yep, they keep keep roping back in. Nice, nice. And I think just having talked with you only for a minute, we we really haven't talked that much. I think you might be more down on SAP than any other mentor I've talked to. So <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting contradiction I'm looking forward to exploring. I, I mean, down on it, I think, would be too harsh a description. I think SAP has just found itself in a hard spot. Um, you know, like we were, we were just talking about, I think this transition to the, the cloud and being a, a cloud provider, a SaaS play, I think that the transition of all that internal logic has like really bogged down SAP. And, and so that's created a ton of technical debt that they have to deal with. Um, and then the other side is, I just think it's a different business model and a different world. And, you know, companies are now becoming used to different sales cycles. And I think SAP as an organization has just got a lot of catch up to do. Well, that's uh, that's a pretty juicy um, talking point. Um, yeah. And so just to kind of set the stage for the listener, we are uh, sort of like it in the home stretch, but we're not done there. We've, we just had the second day keynote um, with Scott, customer keynote and, and now we're like in my hotel room and we have a whole full day to go. So by the end of the day, Brian might have changed a few things, but it sounds like he's pretty certain about his takes. So uh, so tell us a little bit more just about like how you sort of like look at SAP and just the overall, I know you've spent some time looking at the hyperscalers and what they're doing. Like, how do you make sense of everything right now? There, there's so many news announcements coming out of SAP right now too. Like, what, how are you making sense of all this? So I, I mean, I guess I've always viewed SAP as a funny, almost necessary evil for the customers that do buy it. Um, SAP has always been, in my eyes, and I think in most people's eyes, a bit of a clunky software package. But the fact of the matter is that once you buy into it, it just solves a lot of problems. Like a lot of concerns just kind of melt away. There's just an SAP way to do it. It might ne- not necessarily be optimal, but it's still a safe, reliable, long-term investment to make. And I think that that was always the thing that CIOs found comfort in. Um, and even for SAP technologists, like you, you knew that there was going to be a way to do it. It might not be the easiest way. Uh, and you knew where there were gaps, SAP would likely fill them in eventually, or the partner ecosystem would step in. And so there was always something we said for, you didn't have to be too concerned about future-proofing yourself and diversifying your investments, because there was always just a path that you could walk down. And with SAP's transition to the cloud, I think many of those promises and expectations have eroded. Um, and I think that's just kind of the nature of the beast. Um, I think that there was just a tremendous amount of legacy logic that SAP had captured over the decades that it existed, and transitioning all that to the cloud is tough. Um, the hard stop on their maintenance of the old ECC on-prem stuff, I think you know, that's a tighter deadline than anyone wants it to be. Um, so I think there's just, you know, for a lot of confounding reasons, SAPs just found themselves in a bit of a tightrope situation. But the fact of the matter is what they're putting out into the cloud, I think, is good. Um, I think that they are making many of the right product bets. I just think they've missed the boat on a couple opportunities. And I think that there's a lot of things that they're likely just not going to be able to ship fast enough to ensure that they can continue to add all the value they need to for their entire existing customer base. Right, and the end of maintenance you're referring to is 2027, which at this point is an inflexible deadline for a variety of reasons. Correct. I've spoken back channel with SAP about that, and there's actually some very specific legal reasons why they can't move it back further. Yep. Um, honestly, I think they might even consider moving it back 
if, if it wasn't for that. But it, that's, that's hard and fast now, and so now it's up for customers to deal with it. And from my perspective, I think one of the really interesting aspects of this is I uh, recently interviewed uh, the chairman of DSAG or DSAG, however you want to call it, the German user group. And it was really interesting to hear him talk about his own situation because his company um, did a technical upgrade to S4. And then because they weren't ready to really do a transformation, a business transformation exercise around it. And now they're having to kind of go back and do a transformation. But the software, the core software they run their business on has already been implemented. It's awkward. And he doesn't want a lot of his members to go through that. He doesn't want a lot of member companies to, to rush this and to just do kind of a technical push and then not be able to really kind of look at well, how is this going to really support our future business direction? And, you know, and this is something that I have struggled with a little bit because I think that SAP has really been emphasizing speed of implementation. And I think there are times where uh, I understand what they're doing because what SAP is trying to do is to, to avoid that perception that you're going to spend a few years implementing our software before you derive value. That won't work anymore. You have to have quick wins, but but yeah. I think it will be very interesting in this environment because – most of those customers are going to eventually move to SAP S4, but are they going to do it in a right way that derives business value and makes them want to work more with SAP in the future? That's really the, the, the question, and, and that I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see how that plays out because a lot of the partners that serve the SAP community are not haven't made that transition themselves to a a different kind of forward thinking model. And so it's going to be really fascinating to see, but to your point, it's going to be crunch time on these things. Like not just yet, because I think we're still this kind of post pandemic regroup kind of whatever we're in now, mm -hmm. but in the next year, the pressure cooker is going to go on. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I was hearing some numbers about just the, the sheer volume of legacy customers that are going to need to transition yeah. over, you know, the next four years. And when you start breaking down, just the sheer volume of uh, implementations that are gonna have to happen, like you start to get nervous about are there even enough technologists out there to like man those projects? Like right. we're we're talking about that kind of crunch time. I mean, it's it's gonna get a little hairy. And for customers who are not thinking about it in those terms, it's time to start thinking that there's a real risk that when you're ready to switch to S4, there might not be someone to help you man that project. Um, so it's get in line now, get in the queue, get your slot um, ready. And then to your other point about um, the right way to do it, I, I do think that there's still a lot of questions there. It, it feels like there's starting to be like a really firm answer there, which is just clean core. And right. that doesn't make sense. When you think about it as a cloud play, um, it's the only sensible way to go about it. And from what I'm gathering, the BTP solution is is kind of the end-all, be-all hub for all the customization that right. you want to kind of wrap around the core. Right. And, and so I think there's probably some architectural differences people need to think about. And then in terms of conforming process, there's probably some limitations now in terms of how wild you want to get with customizing around your own business. Uh, but by and large, I think most companies are too precious about the intricacies of their process and you know going core, going you know, best practice is probably not such a bad thing for the average enterprise anyway. Um, so ultimately, while I can understand there being customers that feel uneasy about this, I do think that there is a reasonable, relatively clear answer to how they should be thinking about S4. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, certainly SAP has reinforced that, that clean core mantra. And, you know, a lot of the customers I've talked with that have embraced that, have seen the logic of it. But at the same time, I do understand why customers are attached to some of the customizations they've relied upon. And and more to your point, the plan, right? Like that, that talking with ASUG customers on Monday um, when we had us, I had a session with them, with Josh Greenbaum, and that was one of the big things coming up was what are we going to do about skills, talent, yep. to your point? Um, a lot of our internal team needs some kind of upskilling. If they're going to be a factor, <laughs> how are we going to do that? Yep. Uh, and how do we choose the right partner was a really big one, too. And that was one of the big things. And I know you have strong feelings about this from your own entrepreneurial efforts. But like a lot of the smaller partners, we're, 
Josh and I were saying, are the ones that bring the most value and the most expertise. And look, sometimes you need to look away from the big firms to find a firm that really fits your industry and your situation. But you got to do your homework because if you just walk out on the show floor, you're not going to find those people. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you're going to see these big booths with these big displays, and that's fine, but that may not be the partner for you for that project. So it's going to be, I think to your point, I think that's really good sound advice, which is get cracking now. Even if you're not going to start for a while, you better start getting your ducks in a row. Yeah, for sure. There, there's definitely yeah. a race condition happening, and I don't know that all customers are aware of how bad the crunch time is going to get. Uh, and I 100% agree that there is a partner ecosystem problem right now with SAP, especially in North America. And I, I think some of that just has to do with kind of the nature of SAP as an organization, as a sales organization. Um, and I think part of it has to do with COVID and, you know, them not doing tech ed in the U.S. I think is only going to compound the issue. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there's... There's a need to be able to onboard more and better technologists in the SAP space, especially since so much of it is so new. Um, and then, yeah, being able to find a better funnel for customers to identify um, the right service providers, I, I think, is a big issue that needs to be solved for. And I think there's a lot of ways to do it. I don't think it's an existential threat to the SAP ecosystem, but something needs to happen sooner than later to make it easier on the customer to find the right partner. Yeah. Uh, I guess we should talk briefly about the tech ed thing um, because if, if some listeners don't know, the only in-person tech ed next year that I'm aware of is tech ed Bangalore. There isn't going to be an on-the-ground event in the U.S. It will be a virtual experience. Correct. SAP has vowed to uh, improve the virtual experience from what it was last year where it was this hybrid hodgepodge that didn't really work out as far as active participation. There was a lot of good content um, to, to view. So there, there was that, but but the interactive piece was kind of a pretty, a big step back from the pandemic, virtual tech eds. And so SAP's vowed to improve that. But to your point, it, the cancellation of the on the ground part of tech ed has raised a lot of questions as far as like, you know, because talking with SAP leadership, what I know is that a lot of ABAPers can become very effective BTP-based developers, but there's a transition. Yeah. And they need guidance and they need opportunities to learn from their peers. They need to see cool applications. They need to you know, get inspired by the possibility. And I think you can do some of that online, but it, there's no, no comparison with being there in person. So yeah. the key word there for sure is the inspire. So I think when you look at tech ed, and I do think that this is probably where SAP went wrong with making this decision, is they have done a better job in terms of building out educational scaffolding. There are definitely a lot of avenues now to start to understand the new tools and get up to speed, but the education piece was mostly just like a teaser at tech ed. The, the thing that tech ed brings is the community and the inspiration. You, you see people working on cool stuff. You hear about people using solutions in different, clever, innovative ways. Um, and then you get to meet people on the ground and realize, yeah, that's just another person. And they're no different than I. And yet they managed to pull off X or Y or Z. Yeah. I can do that too. And, and the phenomena of being inspired by your peers and being able to learn about these clever new ways to think about the technology, that's what tech ed was really about. And that you cannot replicate virtually. Yeah, I mean, I think there was back in the day, and I know you remember these days because you were tight with the enterprise geeks when the when you know Ed and Thomas and the gang were Absolutely. riding high. And there was that there was that really enviable feeling that SAP had around that show, that see you at Tech Ed feeling where if you missed Tech Ed, you were a chump. Yeah, for you sure. You know what I mean? And you felt like you were legit bummed if you couldn't make that show because you knew you were missing something important, experiential that you weren't going to get. You were going to hear the stories afterwards, maybe on the podcast, and you were just bummed that you weren't there. Yeah. And and SAP really lost lost that. And I think what's interesting is that the I'm a big virtual advocate if you can do it the right way. And I know that SAP, is, I've talked with some of their virtual event team, and I know they're trying to up their game even more from – some of the some things they did well, they're trying to do better, and but it's that the virtual works so much better if you have the relationships from the on the ground 
to then feed the virtual experiences because then you see people you know and yep. you know you have this foundation and so to me like it needs both and you know so hopefully in the future SAP will will rethink that because to your point I think like the time is now to get people together but what can you do? Yeah, I mean, even the mentor program, you know, we have all these Zoom calls on a regular basis, and if there's a push for us to all be able to congregate in person more frequently because at the end of the day, you need some degree of rapport. Like, having that that FaceTime just, just matters. There's an intangible to it. It's like I'm a firm believer of you kind of just need to meet in meet space occasionally. 100%. So you're a little bit down on other stuff too, so let's get into more stuff you're down on with SAP. <laughs> <laughs> And get, I, and get you in trouble with the mentor program. I, I know. So um, I, I, I guess the one thing that I'll, I'll preface this with is I've always been a grump about SAP. I feel like that's part of my brand. That's just the way that I operate with it. It's like they're, they're the big behemoth that's very successful and does a lot of things well. And so I feel like part of it has always been my duty to kind of poke and prod and, and point out the, the chinks in the armor. Hey, I'm happy to meet a grouchy mentor. You know, there, there used to be a bunch of, bunch of us back in the day that could get grouchy. You're, you're kind of down on Datasphere, dude. Uh, yeah, so Datasphere is a funny one for me. And this one, I will pick my words carefully on the record. Um, but I, I guess one of the things, there were two things that, you know, over the last half a decade that I've watched with SAP that was surprising me. One is when this whole data lake vendor phenomena happened, the snowflakes, the data bricks. Uh, when when all that was going on, it surprised me that SAP didn't make an aggressive play because that is their ecosystem. Like the the data is you know the the new oil. Like that was a thing that was talked about uh, a ton. They made a huge investment in Hana, and so I think that they understood how important it was to be a major data player. But then they never took that additional step of really shoring up, being able to provide that same kind of ecosystem that these other new vendors were providing. And so that was one moment that I think SAP whiffed on. The other one is the whole data science phenomena. There, there aren't data analysts anymore. There aren't business analysts. Everyone is called the data scientist now. And to some extent, it is still just traditional BI under a new moniker. But there is a lot more sophistication in analytics now. And there are a lot of people with uh, a much more robust skill set in terms of massaging, understanding, parsing data in order to derive and create real value. And both of those uh, trends, those shifts, I feel SAP missed on in a lot of ways. And I think Datasphere is them maybe to some extent recognizing that and starting to play catch up. And I think because they kind of missed out on those moments, I think that they do have to kind of gradually ease into it and start to build the the infrastructure to build something on, start to build the customer base that they can slowly start recreating uh, some of that value in. And so from that perspective, I think Datasphere makes sense, but I think that's going to be a very long journey. And I think people who are adopting Datasphere now are, are basically just buying some cute middleware that will eventually become a much more robust solution that will, you know, in many ways recreate some of the value you see in other areas now. So yeah, there's I think there's a couple of fascinating things because one of them, and listening to Google talk about this, because we talked with Google on on Monday and our analyst saying that Google was on stage too, is this notion of a more federated approach to data is very interesting. And not all data experts agree, by the way, with a federated approach and whether it works better. But the concept in theory is sort of appealing because it means like not pulling, having to pull data into some kind of other repository, like from all these disparate sources, but essentially, you know, allow the data to reside where where it lives, and and use it from there as as needed for your analytics and your AI. In theory, I kind of like that concept. I mean, I'm not a data federation expert, so I realize a lot of that has to be proven out. Yeah, but I think it's interesting because I think that that some of these data lakes are a little bit of a pipe dream in terms of the way that the digital exhaust is spread over so many devices and platforms. I, I wonder whether that ultimately is going to deliver. So I'm kind of interested in data federation as a concept, whether 
SAP will be the one to kind of prove that out, I, I'd probably be a little more confident in Google's ability <laughs> to do that. And Google's pretty enthusiastic about the concept at the moment. So Yeah, I, I mean, I can definitely see an argument for it. I, I think there's a lot of use cases where it probably makes a ton of sense. And if you have the right uh, tools in place, I can also see how um, the, the big issue being when you have to do like real heavy lifting against data, yeah. then the data transmission suddenly becomes a problem, like both in terms of performance and lag time, but also in terms of cost. Yeah. Um, but if if you're clever and you pre-process data where it resides and then only kick over what you need to, like I think that there's probably a lot of use cases where you can get very sophisticated with data federation um, and really produce a lot of value with a lot less complexity uh, in terms of data reproduction. Um, but Th that is one where it feels very case by case, and I think time will tell whether or not that is the right design pattern. So one other really interesting thing about this that that I get your take on is we did a previous analyst event in New York City in the spring, and SAP pre-announced this con this data sphere to us, and <laughs> the analysts were really resistant because it, it was kind of felt like a techno wizardry kind of thing where. Again, to your point, with announcements like this, the challenge is to figure out what's real, what's already been built, and what's more in the pipeline. And you know, and then you get all these like techno jargony things going on around real time, you know, uh, you know, event streams or whatever it is. You're trying to figure out what's real and what's not. And so this went on for like a good half hour with a lot of like resistance. And then I say people the partner panel on stage, people like Data Robot. Um, Google wasn't there, but Google was on stage this time. And it was so interesting to hear from the partners how enthusiastic they were. And that kind of changed a lot of things about the, the tone of it. Because if SAP hadn't pulled these partners in, I think it would have been really, like, probably a fairly poorly received session that they did on that. But the partners really injected it with some enthusiasm because they were able to explain to us a little bit about why they were excited and why they felt like they were having a better access into like real contextual data from SAP than they were before and the potential that they saw in that. Now granted this was early stages for them. They weren't at the point of rolling out customers. But I thought that was interesting from a partner perspective and it will be interesting to see if partners can deliver a little bit of what you're talking about because I don't think SAP can do it all themselves. Yeah. You know, so and that that I do think is something that has really stood out to me as a major shift in the new cloud-focused SAP is I think they are far more receptive to a partner ecosystem. Like I, I think that they are probably thinking more partner first kind of strategy now, wherein like we can do the application specific things and we can allow our environments to become a little more porous, kind of tear down the walls of the walled garden a little bit. Um, and and just work alongside other vendors to create more complete solutions. And I do think that that is a pretty big difference between old SAP and new SAP. Um, and so when you look at it through that lens, I think Datasphere makes sense. And I think that partners' enthusiasm about that makes sense. And so maybe that is just maybe the first real product to kind of you know, put the flag in the ground that yes, we're taking partnerships seriously. Yes, we want to work with you. Yes, we want to open up data a little bit. Yes, we know we need to supplement our solutions with other solutions. Uh, and so perhaps this is just the beginning of a whole new strategy around how SAP is going to operate and how other people get to kind of play in their sandbox. Well, it's certainly core to their AI strategy right now because they don't have the AI tooling and large language modeling uh, sophistication so that that that's also been opened up to partners where they want to build a business you know AI content on top of that so that's another area where and I think they've been kind of forced down that path because they the things are moving too fast in AI right now around the generative stuff to kind of like try to build your own complete tool set when there's so many powerful components available from other vendors. Yeah, I mean, there, so. there, there's a lot I could I could soapbox around this recent yeah. trend around the large language models. Unfortunately, um, I don't think we have the time to completely deconstruct that in the time we have remaining. <laughs> but yeah, well, so I guess the one thing I will say is that it's it's refreshing to see because it was not that long ago that SAP was very hesitant about whether or not they were going to play with that stuff at all because you know there's some legal gray areas and whatnot. Uh, and 
this Sapphire in particular, they've really brought that to the forefront, really shown how they're going to integrate third-party uh, LLMs into the system and really make it a core part of some of these solutions. And I think it's refreshing to see that SAP is uh, bold enough to really start bringing that stuff into the fold. And it is a good example of where they're just letting partners play in their playground. So I'm just tech doing a little time check. We probably have about four or five minutes. So what else has kind of struck you in terms of either your experiences at the show or anything that we haven't talked about in terms of your views on things? I, I think the, the the one thing that has stood out to me, this Sapphire talking to customers, to people internal at SAP, um, and this is this is not being said explicitly, but I do think that there is... Uh, real organizational friction at SAP right now because they are definitely changing direction. They are evolving as a company to become this cloud vendor. Um, they are evolving as a company to be more partner friendly. And I think, you know, SAP has always had a very strong sales force uh, that's relatively opinionated in the way that they do things. I think by design, it's what makes them effective. Um, but I think that there's probably organizational friction now in terms of how people are used to purchasing from hyperscalers and things being self-service and relatively easy and being able to quickly turn things on once you're ready to start going down a certain path. And um, I think SAP is still trying to figure out the right formula to replicate some of that because you were talking earlier about implementation speed is a huge Point of contention now with mm -hmm. SAP. It's a huge focus point, and they're doing a better job at getting faster with it. But the procurement process before you can actually start those projects, right. like that is still sluggish. And I think that's some of the stuff that they need to just kind of work out organizationally. And I think that'll just take time. I mean, I think, you know, it's a, a big ship. It's going to take a while to truly get it to right mm -hmm. course. Uh, but I do think they'll get there. I don't think it's like some sort of existential threat. I think it's just a very fascinating uh, organizational phenomena that they're they're dealing with right now. Mm. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you're going to try to figure out before you leave Orlando? What's on your agenda for burning questions? Anything else? Um, I I I'm still trying to unpack a little bit more about the the internal intricacies of what's going on with SAP. And I am interested in understanding more about what some of their product strategy looks like, especially for some of the legacy customers. So like, I, I don't know exactly what's on the roadmap, but you know, like oil and gas and AFS, some of those mm -hmm. uh, industry specific modules, um, I don't know how many of those are actually um, in the, the roadmap and It'll just be interesting to kind of understand more about what that's going to look like, what the fallout from that is, like, you know, what's going to be the interim plan or do they need to kind of just rebuild what they need to in BTP? Like, I think that there's mm -hmm. like some question marks there for the subset of customers that are potentially going to get orphaned in terms of the solution that they're used to versus what they're going to get, you know, for n number of years post 2027. Um, and so that's the stuff that I'm kind of just curious to hear how that's going to work and how SAP is thinking about it and how they're just going to solve some of the friction points that they've created for themselves internally. And I guess the other thing is the partner ecosystem stuff. I, I'm still interested in hearing who it is that's really going to lead, lead the charge on starting to clean some of that up and build that new better funnel to let the smaller, uh, better boutique firms kind of do a better job at finding the the right customers at the right time. Had a really good talk with SAP leadership about that, and just and they were kind of saying, well, the challenges of various aspects of that. And I was like, elevate the ones that are doing an awesome job. Like, let's start there. You know, like we saw a lot of cool customers on stage. Let's see some cool partners on stage. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you start by giving them a platform. The ones that you think are really delivering on. To, to your point, the new message, the speed to value, whatever, where, however you want to call it. Yeah, absolutely. Cloud savvy, whatever. Well, it's great to talk with the grouchy mentor. This, <laughs> this keeps tradition, many traditions alive, Brian. Well, well done. Uh, thanks for joining me. And now I have to do a mad scramble across a big, vast expanse to get to the media center for some interviews. So well, thank you, Brian.